Yes. Oh. Oh. Fundraiser. <laughs> Big plans. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Rabbil alamin. Wa salatu wa salam. Rasulullah Sayyidina Nabiya Mursalin. Nabiya Muhammad. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma bad. So last time I think we had finished up talking about some of these points in the situations where backbiting is actually allowed. Uh, we had mentioned revealing injustice. What is a good example of this? Well, there is no example. <laughs> When someone is oppressed. Uh, when there's an individual who's being oppressed, uh, other people don't know about it. Uh, one of the examples we might be used if there's a um, if there's a child who's being abused, right? If we, if we know somebody is being abused, like a child is being abused in the community by a teacher or by someone else, can we allow that abuse to continue? No, right? That's something that has to be shared. That's not something that we can stay quiet upon. Um, assisting in repelling evil and turning the oppressor to good. If you know a friend is taking advantage of another friend, then what, are, what is something that you can do? Join them in taking advantage. Right, all right. Obviously, you can help, you can help in the oppression. Uh, that's one. <laughs> that, that is one. <laughs> that's one option. What, what else can you do? Advise, uh, warn. Right, so you can definitely advise. So, and the, and the way to advise, so sometimes if you have two parties involved, right, you have the oppressor and the person who's oppressed. If I go and I talk to the oppressed person, um, and, and this, this happens sometimes in a number of situations, or even in work settings, especially like even in Islamic institutions, what happens is you have the institution, they'll, they'll take advantage of people. How, how, does, how do institutions or Islamic institutions tend to take advantage of people? Uh, oh, it's too expensive. You should do it. What uh, the, the very famous phrase? Feasibility, uh, right? You should do it. Feasibility. Uh, you should do it. Free sabilla. You know what I mean? Like and uh, like you shouldn't have to pay anything. So this this is actually a type of oppression, right? You it's not it's not correct to use spiritual blackmail. It's not okay to use emotional blackmail or even physical blackmail. Any type of blackmail is not allowed. Um, if there's a value to something, then you pay for that value. Either you can afford it or, or you can't. So what can I do to help the person who's being oppressed? If I say, okay, well, so-and-so, he's doing this or he's saying this, they, we have to understand that relationships are always two ways, right? There's always two sides to a relationship. It's not, even with the oppression that's happening, sometimes the, the, the one who's being oppressed, he, he or she can give off signals that it's okay to. To, to take advantage. Um, and and that's, that's not fair to the other person. Just because I failed to put my boundaries forward and then somebody violates those boundaries, it's not fair because I never told them what my boundaries were in the first place. Um, so we have to make sure that we're very clear. And, you know, I think the example that I used was, you know, I, I left my, I left a hundred dollar bill on the front seat of my car with my car unlocked. And then, then I complained that somebody stole my money. And that, that, that's not fair. Like I, I'm, I'm inviting problems and I'm inviting issue. I am not in a place to test other people. It is only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who tests them. Let's say uh -huh. in the case of rape and someone is not dressed accordingly. Of course, it's not an excuse. Sure. That, the same thing. Uh, Ahsan, so the, I, think, I think that's an excellent example. So uh -huh. not, they're like, they're supposed to be very revealing. Yeah. And they get raped. Yeah. Of course, it's not an excuse to get raped. Uh -huh. You short your pardon, right? Okay. Anyway. Okay. So I, I think this needs to be navigated on a different number. Of, like uh, there are a number of layers that need to explore, be explored in low specific situations. Like, you know, does anyone to be deserved? Does anyone deserve to be raped? No. no. no, this is like point blank. There's no justification in any any way, shape, or form. Like, but use a predator. A predator always looks for what? The, the easiest prey. Right. The, the predator will always look for the easiest prey or the predator will always come up with excuses on what to look for or to justify whatever it is that that predator is doing. So we as individuals, we as people, as large of, large of a part of uh, part of a larger population, what are some things that I can do in order to minimize being a perceived victim? Take I, right. So taking those precautions is something that's important. Again, and, and like I said, this is why it's a layered discussion. The first part of the layer is like, no, n like nobody is deserving of it. I'm sorry. Yeah. And again, that that's a separate situation that, that we can definitely deal with and, and talk about, because even with children, there are certain things like if a child is known to be quiet, if a child is known to be shy, if a child is not known to speak his mind, that, that again, we have I haven't equipped myself like 
I have not equipped my son or daughter with the skills that they need. If I never developed a relationship with them where they can actually come and tell me the things that are going on or that they might have been touched inappropriately, because we have to understand even in a situation with children, and, and we'll take that as a second case study, but let's let's deal with this first one, inshallah, and then we'll move on to that one. But I'm saying even, even us as individuals, we should always try to do the best that we can to minimize that perception of being a potential victim. Um, one, of the, one of the examples also, like I've, I've gotten a series of questions on this too, in terms of the masjid, what is the purpose of the security? What is the goal or what is the role of the security? To protect us? Think, I want you to think about that. So, all right. No, so basically they're just a first line of defense and to call 911 at the end of the day, like if you, if you have here in Dar Hijjah, we have over a thousand people praying every night. Uh, do you guys know how many security members we have or staff we have? We have five, right? And out of those five, do you guys know how many are armed? Yeah, two, two to three are armed. The other two are busy with, uh, with the parking, right? They actually set up the parking. And out of those three, two are involved in comms. One is, in char one is also a sound engineer and the other one also takes care of the media. So you only technically have how many? You have one who is available. Now, this one person, who does he choose to protect? Do you understand the problem? Out of the thousand people, who is he going to choose? Himself? Right, he's going to choose himself first and foremost, but like, which is natural. But but I'm saying even even with that, even if you say okay, all five are available at all times, if you have somebody who is going in, in is trying to infiltrate the institution, who is going to be his first target? Woman. No, no, the security. Right. You remove the security first. Right. That that is going to be like, am I, man, I'm just like giving like a handbook on how to do this. Right. But like <laughs> so you, the, the first target is going to be the security and the second target will probably be me. So anyway, like there it's, it's important to understand, like, you know, all of these things. So if we're saying that the purpose is not to protect the people, what is the purpose? Remember the perception thing we were talking about earlier? It is to make this institution be perceived as a more difficult target. That's it. A soft targets and hard targets, deterrence, right? These these are very common terms that that are used, like when you talk about institutional protection. At the end of the day, those individuals are are meant to be a deterrent, less so than actual protection. So, and when I come to Dal Hijra, who's in, who's responsible for protecting me? Me. And that's, that's, that's different. Like, you know, I know, I understand, like, sometimes it might come across as cold. It might come across as like a difficult concept, but ultimately I'm responsible for protecting myself. Like they, we, we all are. And, and how do we do that? By making sure we're taking precautions. Every time I walk into a public space, what are some things that I should be aware of? I should be aware of my surroundings. Like, you know, what are the exits? You know, what are the, what are the possible entries? You know, where are the people, you know, which direction are people moving in? You know what I mean? Like making sure that I'm not getting into a space where I'm going to be blocked or I'm going to get cornered. And, and again, like this is not, it's not about being paranoid. It's just about having a general awareness because it, is there a possibility that, that something bad happens? Yeah, I, I, absolutely. You know what I mean? And, and it's important to, to be aware of those things. So go, going back to this example, like it, it's important for us to make sure that at least we're putting off a perception where we are more, a more difficult target than the one who is next to us because the predator will always go after the weakest target. That's for, that's, that's for the example of the women, the example of the institution, and the example of the children. What is my job as a parent now? To, to, to educate and equip my child. So uh, I remember, like, this was actually a huge paradigm shift for me. Uh, I went to a, a, a sexual abuse uh, seminar talking about how to deal with sexual abuse and how to deal with the problems that we have in the community. And we had a, I think she was, she's called like a sexual abuse specialist or something like that. I forgot what her title was, but she said, she asked the question. She's like, when should we start teaching our kids sex education? Huh? Yeah. Right. As soon as they can start talking and as soon as there is a recognition of their body parts, like, you know, I mean, obviously you're not going to get into the details like that, that intimacy and all these things, those things come later. But if they have an awareness of their of their private areas at that time, you have to educate them. What 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 is the, what should I tell my two year old that when, when she knows about that, she has these private areas and she shouldn't show them to people. No one can touch it. And, and on top of that, if anybody does or anybody tries immediately come to me because the predator, he's not going to go in the first time. What is he going to do? He's going, he's going to build a relationship and try to test the waters, right? That, that's what they all do. Like they're predators. They're, they are always probing, looking for the weakest, 
link. Uh, so what do we do? We try to make our children, our wives, ourselves harder targets. Yes. Well, unfortunately, in the children planning, uh, a large portion of the sexual abuse on children is from somebody that they know. No, no, wh which I get. So no, no, the relationship, not necessarily, okay. not necessarily. Yes, it, so the trust, but from who? So he, he, let, let me give an example. Like, and this is this is a personal example. My, I, I have a cousin. Me, well meaning he himself has only daughters so when he sees my daughters he has a natural gravitation toward them because it reminds him of his daughters who grew up and went to college and he misses that time so what does he want to do he wants to play with them he wants them to come sit in his lap my girls were uncomfortable they didn't they didn't know him and they didn't want to go sit in his lap and my wife she goes to me later she was like she was like you know i was really surprised at, at your behavior and i was like why what happened she was like you didn't force them to go sit in his lap but think about that. What, I was like, yeah, because I, if my child is feeling uncomfortable, I'm going to reinforce that concept, like that you trust your instincts. If, if there's something you're feeling is you don't like, it's okay. Trust that. I, and, and I will support you. I will support your feelings. I will support your instincts. But in many families, that doesn't happen. In many families, what happens? Oh, that's your uncle. Stop, you know, stop being silly. No, it's okay. You know, no, just go sit. And you understand. And, and, and again, I'm not saying, you know, you know, may Allah preserve and protect him. He didn't have any ill intent. There, there, it wasn't there. But that, that wasn't the, the, uh, the lesson that was trying to be taught at that point. The lesson that was trying to be taught is it's okay for you to trust your instincts. And if you ever have a feeling, I as a father will support you and be supportive of that. So th these are things, so that, that's why I mean by the relationships, because many times the parents will dictate or force the relationship with the, with, with that shroud of thinking that what? It's, huh, right? Because, and like you said, and, and this is statistically, right? Not just in your personal pr practice, statistically, most molestation happens within the home. Most cases. Most cases of molestation happen within the home. So it, and, and sometimes it can be very close. Right, even a father, or even a grandfather, or these cases, you know, and, and it happens. So, what do we again? What do we have to do as parents? We have to reinforce these concepts with our children, and that allow them to trust their instincts, allow them when they're uncomfortable to come and tell us, you know, regardless of what it is. And then we, as parents, cannot be dismissive either. I, I understand that. So, e even when even when children have problems with school stuff like that, my kids will come home and tell me. That, you know, we had this, like, the teacher will complain, and I'll listen to the, what the teacher has to say. I'll listen to what my child has to say. But what my child has to say, I will take both of them with a grain of salt. Because a child at the end of the day is what? A child. And they have skewed conceptions of reality. Right? Sometimes my child will feel he's a ninja turtle, and my daughter will feel she's, you know what I mean, like a, a unicorn. It's okay. They're children. You know what I mean? Like, they, they have those, like, they have a skewed sense of reality, which is why you can't completely trust everything that they say. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't listen. And as parents, we, should, we need to learn to filter what it is that they're telling us so that we learn to separate from fact from fiction and learn to reinforce those concepts and give them that idea of like, when you're uncomfortable, don't, be confident enough to remove yourself from that situation. Be confident enough to say no. So, uh, anyway, assisting <laughs> and repelling evil and turning the oppressor toward good. This, this is in helping, in terms of helping the victim. Like if we, the idea is to build the character of potential victims, you know, and, and that's all of us, right? There's nobody who is not a potential victim. Like we, we can all, we all have the propensity of being taken advantage of. And, and I'm sure many of us have in different ways, shapes and forms. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the thing is, there, there are some things like as, as a community, we are not a, um, we're not a law enforcement body, right? So there, there's very little we can do to discourage such predatory behavior, but there are certain, I think rules and regulations that we can follow as institutions if somebody has has been deemed or has had a a sexually predatory case previously or is known to be a uh, sexual offender what should we as an institution not do 
not hire them, right? We don't put them around youth. It doesn't make sense, right? You know, if if this person wants to do construction, okay, that's fine. You know, I mean, like I, I'm I'm saying that there's always room for forgiveness, but forgiveness doesn't mean putting that person in the same situation to be tested with the same problem or the same issue again. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't like as an institution, we should prevent, like if you have a history of sexual misconduct, this person will never be around vulnerable populations who are vulnerable po populations in general, women and, and children, right? The, you are not allowed around to be these people. Or if you are, then you will be you'll be watched, right? You are going to be accompanied, you're going to be supervised, but you're not going to be put in those in those positions because you, we are not going, we refuse to be the experiment, right? Like that's, we can't, like we, this is not a risk we are worth taking because the consequences are too high in that situation. Um, be reporting, I think this is something else that's something that's really important. If we as, an, as a community come to an agreement like, hey, it, we don't play with these cases. If there's a case that comes to any single one of us, it, is, it will be reported immediately. This is not a case of, oh, well, we're trying to protect the father. He was the main provider or, you know, oh, you know, she, she, it was just a one off. No, I'm sorry. Like the, there are everything has consequences. Yeah. You know, your Toba, that's between you and Allah. That has nothing to do with me and you like that. This is a different type of thing. So I think if you if we as a community develop like a zero tolerance policy for these things in terms of hiring within the institution, um, if if a reference or a call comes to us about that individual from another institution where they will have access to those same populations, the same thing. We will tell them like, this is the reason we did not hire them. Why? Because in this situation, it is, we, we're we actually protecting both sides, right? We're protecting the person because we don't want him to fall into the same mistake again, right? This, a person, maybe they made toe, blah, blah, blah. Why test a person with the same sin? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to put them in that situation. And, and then again, uh, within the community, if we hear about it, because at the end of the day, even if an accusation comes, even if child protection services gets involved or the police gets involved, whatever the case might be, and, and it might be an inconvenience for that family, right? That, that nothing happened, but, but what? Now the doubt has been removed. Um, it, this doesn't mean that we we start spying on each other. That's that's not because you start developing mistrust and you know all, all of these other problems with the community itself. But when something real surfaces, right? If a, if some type of concrete evidence surfaces, then that warrants an investigation. So I, I think like maybe maybe those are probably the two easiest ways to do it. In addition to like parental training, like there has to be a lot of training for parents for for these things. Um, you know a lot. Well, you know we didn't really have to deal with this in our country, but, but yeah, because everything's shoved under the rug. It's, it's not, it's, it's not like, oh yeah, like we're pure and it doesn't happen. Like, it, no, it, it happens. It's just, nobody talks about it, right? These, these, are, it's not, it's not something that's discussed. It's not something that's tried. Um, and it's, it's really unfortunate as the, one of the advantages of, of coming to the United States for many people is they, they no longer have to maintain the status quo. They're no, no longer bound by their cultural regulations. They're no longer bound by a lot of the things that held them back in their, in their home countries. And, and with that freedom comes more responsibility. And obviously you, you have, a, you have a, a whole set of other problems when that happens too. Uh, uh, seeking fatwa, warning Muslims of evil. This is, again, this is very much in relation to what we were just talking about and what discussing. Uh, a person is known by a name that has or points out a possible shortcoming. We had also talk, spoken about previously a pointing out someone proud of his sins. Why? Because he's doing it publicly, right? So there, there are things that are done publicly. Uh, in addition to this, we had also spoken about public figures. We said public figures, whether they be in Dawah, whether they be in politics, whether they be uh, in, in the media, that these people, it is also okay to speak about them concerning what? Right, concerning their public life, right? You know, so if there are things that they are making public, then it is okay for us to speak about them because that information is always, it's also public. It's not like we're going behind their back and they're talking about them. Speaking about their private life is different. Like, you know, talking about their kids, talking about their wife. That's, that's, those are things that in general, in general, people like to keep private and things that they don't like to share with the public. Uh, the next chapter, I think it's about, we talked about Toba, like how to seek, how to seek expiation for backbiting. And what was the general rule concerning seeking expiation or for backbiting that there are two things that have to be done yes right sure there has to be toba action what do you mean by action um, as in, uh, seeking repentance, like, uh, forgiveness from the person. okay seek, yeah sure so we will we'll say forgiveness and pardon okay just just to make it easy uh, so forgiveness is between you and a lot and pardon is between you and the violated party and the person so in general these are the two conditions for that if what what are the cases where pardon isn't sought or can't be sought or shouldn't be sought 
when the victim is dead. All right, if somebody's passed. Well, just, you don't uh -huh. know where he's located. Okay, yeah, you don't have access. You're going to say something else or no? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, if it worsens the situation, and then this is something that's that's really important. And the thing is, it actually there has to be an actual worsening of the situation, not a perceived one. Okay, because many times, like it's like, oh, you know, if I tell him, then you know, he won't talk to me anymore, or like he'll be mad at me. Like, yeah, you just didn't have to talk about him. Like, <laughs> like, like yeah, obviously he's going to be upset. Like, it's not. You know, the thing is, so what we mean by worsening the situation is like there there could be legal consequences for you. Like that, that's what we mean by that. And I just, I just want to be very clear in that. Is it possible that your relationship breaks? Yeah, it, it definitely is. But I also made a choice when I spoke about him or I spoke about her. Uh, the next section we had gotten into, and we, we, I think we went through this hadith, right? Yeah, okay. And we explained what it was. Uh, And this is it. We, we spoke about this and we spoke about Hassan, uh, Hassan kind of trolling the guy who backbit him, right? Um, and then the next chapter was uh, tail carrying. Hey, what is tail carrying? Hearsay? Yeah, so this it's like hearsay. It, it, Namima is exactly what it is. But, but what actually is it? Wait. Huh? Yeah, it, it, yeah, I mean, it, gossip is definitely a part of it. Gossip is definitely part of it. And what, what, what is gossip? Uh, just hearing? Right, so it's, it's not just hearing things, but it's also carrying them forward, right? It's also carrying them forward. Um, very, very, unfortunately, very common in WhatsApp, right? In Telegram groups and Facebook. <laughs> uh, but it, it's, we definitely can fall into Namima and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, and then he says, Hamazim Masha'an bin Namim. Now, Abdullah bin Mubarak, he says, Azanim, here, Azanim, is the child of Zina that cannot withhold information. Why do you think he said that? Okay, so not well, not just that. A child of zina, like this, uh, this is in in the linguistic sense. This is what do we what we call a bastard, right? That a bastard child is a child of zina. Why why did he use this phrase? Do we use the bastard in a uh, praiseworthy no. way? <laughs> no, Th this is to show like the the gravity, like you said. This is to show the gravity of the situation that this is a product of. Ill, Ill consent. This is a ill conceived product that you have here. And because this product is ill conceived, it cannot even withhold this information. And this is how Abdullah Mubarak is describing this individual. So here, Hamazim Masha'an Bimanim, to any backbiter or slander monger, and course, and on top of that, an imposter. So Zanim, an imposter. But in, in, in these descriptions, is ab about this in individual. You guys know this is in Surah to what? Uh, in Qalam. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is describing this individual in this way, you know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Uh, so here is a way lulikulli humazati lumaza, woe to every fault finding backbiter. Hamalatil uh, Hatab, the firewood carrier. This is specifically talking about who? Uh, the, Abu, Abu Lahab's wife, right? Abu Lahab's wife. It, because she used to tail carry, right? She is, she is now tasked in, in carrying this wood because she used to tail carry. And where is she carrying this wood to? Huh? Okay, she's carrying it to Jahannam. But you, what do we know about Jahannam? What, it, what is the fuel for Jahannam? People and stones. So why would Allah, what, what is part of this punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having her carry this hatab or having her carry this firewood or this kindling wood? Huh? All right, so it's, it's either burning her own punishment or she's putting it toward what? Because the surah, surah is what? Surah? Uh, talking about who? Abu Lahab. And she was one who used to take a lot of pride in in her status and of her husband. 
Yeah, it, no, so it can be. It can be a metaphor that she's she's carrying Kindle. And who is she carrying this Kindle to? She can either be carrying it toward herself or she can be carrying it to burn. Her husband, right? Because even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on in the in the verse, he says that around her neck is what? A coarse, yeah, like it's like this, this coarse rope. Why? Because the, the whole chapter is about humiliating Abu Lahab and his wife, right? That's, the entire thing is humiliation. So what is more humiliating than you were known to for wearing this court like this amazing jewelry now you have this rope that you are being used to drag the kindle to burn either yourself or or your husband the one who you were given status to it's just a he, completely humiliating image right the entire surah is meant to be humili um, humiliation of, of abu lahab um so then uh, going on but betrayed them so they could not benefit them against Allah at all. And over here, this is these are the two women that are being discussed here. Who do you guys know? The wife, they're both of them are wives of prophets. Lut and No. Lut and No. Uh, so here, uh, Lut's wife would tell them of guests, and No's wife would say that he is is crazy. So you, you, th this is where the tail carrying is happening. This is where the gossip is happening that uh, they would carry this information, right? They wouldn't be able to withhold this information and they would kind of carry this information uh, forward to others in order to harm somebody. So here the tail carrier will not enter paradise and namam, it will not enter Jannah, this hadith is a Muslim. Here uh, the qatat will not enter paradise and here qatat is the tail carrier. Uh, Ka'b al-Ahbar, he relates that Bani Israel was facing a drought, so they sought help from Musa repeatedly until it was revealed to him that Allah does not help the ones who among them who is insistent on tail carrying. Musa asked, who is he so that I may remove him from our mists? A man said, I prevent you from tail carrying, but do so myself. Then all of them sought forgiveness and it began to rain. So basically the man came forward, right? So the, the man came forward. Uh, and he admitted to his mistake and he sought forgiveness and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it rain. And, and the purpose of the story is to show the effect of one person and how it can prevent the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so there's some narrations. Uh, it is said that a man followed another for seven leagues, uh, which is approximately 21 miles, just to receive seven words. So he said, I came seeking from you what Allah has given you in knowledge. Tell me. And he says, uh, what is weightier than the sky and what it contains? What is more spacious than the earth? What is harder than a rock? What is hotter than fire? What is colder than the bitterest cold? And what is more valuable than the sea and what it contains? And lastly, what is more disgraced than an orphan? Right? So the this idea of an orphan, why... Why does Islam look at, or why are orphans described in such a, a, a pitiful image in general? Sure. Why is it, what is, what is difficult about it? Like, you know, why are, why is it that we consider them miskeen? The Prophet said the one who puts his hand on the head of the orphan, like, you know, he has received Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy or oh, kama qal. Um, and you, you have so many things talking about the orphan in this way. Why? Because loses the, the, the emotional attachment to a parent. Okay. Parent. Right. So, right. They have no, like, essentially, they have no guardian, right? There's, there's no one to speak for them. They, these individuals, they become wards of the state, right? There's no one to speak on their behalf. There's no one to defend their rights. There's no one to stand up for them. You know, these, these people, they have no status. And, and because they have no status, this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah, you know, let, let just look at that. They have no status in this world. So what does Allah do for them? Allah raises them and gives them status in, in his eyes. And that, that is out of his infinite mercy. I just want to talk about the word orphan. Yeah. In America, they don't use the word orphan. They use yeah. um, foster kids. Yeah. And it's a misconception mm. because it is an orphan. Yeah. Because they use the word foster, I think a lot of us don't understand it. Exactly. When, when, yeah, I, I, that, that can definitely be. I think within, within the Muslim, Muslim, Muslim community, they're a little bit more educated on the subject than I, I think a lot of the Western uh, world. But the problem with using the term foster kids is that um, the, the misconception is that they've already, they're already taken care of. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, right? But that's not true that's at all. They're, yeah. Well, I mean, which is a lot of. Um, 
Well, no, it's a lot of things that are happening, right? So when you have you have terms like affordable housing, uh, right? You know, I mean, uh, it, it makes us feel good or you have green energy, right? You know, these these things, they make us feel good. But the, the cost that is associated with many of these programs doesn't justify what it is, the purposes that they're serving. Uh, I mean, at least they look nice, right? Um, so here he answers. He says, so the wise man, he responded. He says, accusing the innocent is weightier than the sky and what it contains. And he says, the rights of others are more spacious than the earth. The content heart is more valuable than the sea and what it contains. Uh, desire and jealousy are hotter than the fire. The need for a close relative who is unable to fulfill is colder than the bitterest cold. And the heart of a rejecting disbeliever is harder than a rock. And the, the exposed tail carrier is more disgraced than the orphan. And obviously the point that uh, is being highlighted is, is this last one. But you guys think about these points. And again, it's just a wise saying. It's not obviously it's not written in stone, and it's not necessary. But um, I the the one that really stood out here was here for for me. Desire and jealousy are hotter than fire. What does that mean? More damaging and more expansive than basic. Okay. Because it's not just something that you would be feeling, but it's also something that it it affects. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And that just has massive consequences. Uh -huh. It's something you cannot control easily. Uh, right, like some of sure. control, but yeah. you guys are okay. Yeah, and, 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 the, and the other thing about uh, about fires is like it, it's the, the 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 characteristic about them that, that we know is like it's it, it consumes, mm -hmm. right? Fires just consume everything, and and this desire and jealousy it can consume all of our thoughts, it can consume all of our emotions, our direction, uh, and and many times this is this is the, this is the thing that I see uh, in many. And many marriages that that cause like a, a break, like the jealousy over who is going to have the children, uh, and and what happens is like the the mother will be jealous of the father, or the father jealous of the mother, and they will use the children as pawns to kind of hurt each other, you know. And and it, it's just just out of that, just out of that jealousy and out of that spite, you know. My last parent that protect us. Any other uh, comments on any of these? Or is it in yeah. The rights of people in general. So the rights of people in general. So because the thing is, if if you think about it, every every human, every human has the right to be what has to, has to be respected and honored, right? And, and respect is honor. It's just, this is this is huge, right? You know, this this is a really really big deal because under that respect and honor, a lot of these interactions have are are dictated, because I can't just talk to this person any way that I want. I can't just you know, uh, have a transaction any way that I want. I can't just utilize this person any single way that I want. Why? Because it's a human being in front of me, you know, and, the, and this person has, has certain rights. This, per, this person is to be honored and respected. And even the times that I am allowed to maybe disrespect them, it's only when. Right, there's something, there's something wrong has been done. Like I've, I've been violated in, in some way. Right? J just because I don't like how somebody looks or talks or acts, it doesn't give me the right to strike them or to hit them or to curse them or yell at them. But the moment that they violate my honor, I, I, I have now the right to, to react, right? I have a right to react with, uh, with equal force, yes. incentive for people to take it upon themselves to get their rights back okay not, which is a, a lawless state sure so, but that you're talking about vigilantism at that point but if somebody let me let me give let me give a clear example if somebody's trying to rob me if someone's trying to rob me at, at this point if i if i'm armed and i shoot that person so what would happen in the, in this case even even in an islamic state what would happen uh, right. The, no, you'd go to court. Well, shoot the kill versus shoot the, versus armor. But this is the, an investigation, right? There, 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 there'd be an investigation at this point, right? You, the, if the police came to my home and I was like, well, there are a lot of signs there, right? This guy, I don't know him. He's a clear stranger. You can go back. He has no relationship with me. He's in my home. My front door is broken. So all of those are signs of what? 
right? There's a breaking entry that, that was happening. He was armed, right? I shot him. Now there can be an investigation. Did I shoot to kill? You know, did I give him any warning? Did I do all of these things? But the thing is at that point, have you, you're now discussing the type of self-defense. You're not discussing on whether a crime was committed from my end. Does that make sense? Uh, so does, everything warrants a, a, an investigation. So with the vigilantism, I, I definitely agree. You know, like you, this, this can become a huge problem and which is why you have a problem with like so many terrorists, right? Like they've taken so many things upon themselves to go and be like, okay. And, but the thing is like, okay, well, who's overseeing this? What investigation is happening here? You, you cannot be judge, jury, and executioner. That's not, that's not how Islam works because a person might say, okay, well, you know, why did you kill him? It's like, oh, because I saw him kill someone else. So I executed him in an Islamic state. There would be an investigation and you would still be held accountable because you are not a representative of the law. Like you were not appointed by the people, you know, subhanAllah, it's, it's, it really is amazing how authority plays a role within the religion. And the reason it plays that role is to, to have structure or to have function, to have, you have checks and balances and, and accountability. But so that, that's all I mean. Like I'm, a, I'm allowed to retaliate. Will that retaliation be investigated? Yes, I, I, I definitely think so. But it, it doesn't mean that I can never retaliate to, to someone. No, yeah, you know, like, but the thing is, who, who carries out the justice? Yeah, right, the, the state, right? It, it is always going to be the state that carries out that justice. But when individual rights are being being violated, you know, if, if, I see, if I see someone abusing my kid, for example, right, and like, I just start beating him, I'm not right for, for doing that. But it, but it, for me to, to retaliate, did I have a right to retaliate? Yes. Yeah, right. Do I have the right to retaliate? Yeah. Was my retaliation appropriate? This, this will be seen in a court of law. Yeah. Um, on the flip side, there's the Good Samaritan rule. Like, yeah. if you tried to save someone and end mm -hmm. up killing them, yeah. you could be sued for it. Yes. It's really crazy. No, no. I, so, so the thing is, it, it, it depends, right? There are, there are a lot of things. It depends. Like, you know, for example, somebody's crossing the road um, and they're about to get hit by a car and you see the person is elderly. So what do you do? You push the person onto the sidewalk and they break their arm. What, what, what do you, what do you do in this situation? You know, and the thing is, am I, am I obligated to go run in now and push the person? The, I mean, these are all very valid questions, right? These are all very valid questions. Um, I, I remember one time I, I was driving like, and I had a Jeep. It was like, it had snowed really hard in New Jersey. They were not ready for the snowstorm at all. I, I put it in four by four and I was chilling, you know, I mean, I was just like driving around everyone. And there is this, there is literally this couple that was stuck on an incline. My kids were getting out of school and the buses were not running. So I was going to school to go pick them up. These guys were literally waving me down, trying to almost jump in front of the Jeep to, <laughs> to try to get me to stop so I could pull their, pull their car up. And my wife was like, she's like, why aren't you stopping? I was like, number one, we have to pick up the kids. Like the, the kids are the priority. These are two adults. You know I mean? Like they'll, they'll figure it out or a tow company or whatever the case might be. I said, secondly, what am I going to do? Put a chain and pull their car, you know what I mean? And mess up their bumper and then have to deal with insurance. You know what I mean? Like the decisions are more complicated than, than we make them out to me. Was it the right decision? Allahu alam. You know, I, I, I don't know. But at the end of the day, like there are layers of decisions and because everything has consequences, many times we don't know. Are there situations where people get pushed they break their arm, but they see the car pass by, you know, and most people, most normal people, what are they going to do? They'll be grateful. They'll be like, sure, man, I will take a broken arm over dead. Right. <laughs> and, and they'll, and they'll look to the person, they'll thank them. Some people will even give them a reward. Yeah. And, but, but do you have those, those petty spiteful people who exist? Yes, absolutely. Should I, should I live my life because of that small minority? No, right. I can't make my decisions based off of that. And even us, when we make our individual decisions, it's important. Like there, there are a number of things, like there's a list of priorities that we all have, like our own personal priorities. It's important to go through that list and see how we can help and how we should help. Right? It's, it's very, if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the lowest part of Iman is to what? Remove. Right. Remove something harmful from the road. Like what if you're actually removing harm from a person? You know what I mean? Like how, how much greater is, is that? So is it important to be involved? Yeah, absolutely. But again, like, you know, everybody has their own priorities. Everybody has their own uh, things going on. Yeah. I would just add like uh -huh. the female drivers because yeah. I used to drive a lot to Canada yeah. and you would see a lot of situations. Mm -hmm. We would just stop and find the, the mile marker. And yeah. And just recall it in. And, and, and the thing is there, there's different ways to, yeah. to participate. And, and this is like, which, which is, which is a great way of dealing with a lot of these issues. Um, 
I remember we were driving by an accident and um, one of the guys with me, I was like, Hey, can you just call 911? And he was, he was like, he was like, why? He's like, you know, there's traffic backed up. I was like, but there's no guarantee anybody called in the accident. I said, at the least uh, by reporting it, what, what is the worst going to happen? That they're going to get a repeat report, yeah. right? That's, that's the worst yeah. that could happen. And, and the best that can happen is like, you're the first one to actually inform them so that medical, you know, emergency services can get to, can get to the scene. So there are, there are layers of involvement that's important for us to understand. And again, like this, if, if I'm alone, you know, is it a good idea to stop and like, you know, a completely remote deserted area to help an individual who might, again, remember we were talking about how we become a, the, the perceived victim and how to minimize those chances. Is it a good idea in that situation and there's no cell phone signal? No, I would say drive until you get to a place where there's signal and the mile marker thing, call it in and say, hey, I saw someone. Because at the end of the day, the person could actually need help or that person's a predator. And either way, you, you've sent in the appropriate people to investigate the this, this situation. Uh, the, the next chapter is the punishment of tail carrying and uh, how to deal with it. Inshallah, we'll, we'll talk about this next time. You, you guys want to have class next week? Because it's, I know it's the day before, uh, it's a day or two before Eid. You okay with that? Okay. And then that, that week, we'll be moving back to Wednesdays, Inshallah. Uh, when in uh, in Shawwal, but it won't be that week. It'll probably be either be the week, the following week or the week after. Inshallah, I'll let I'll let Ramsha know. If you guys aren't in the group already, then uh, if if you guys could just share the QR code and kind of scan yourself and get you, uh, get into the WhatsApp group so you can stay up to date with the messaging. Inshallah, but we'll stop here. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Ramsha, you want to share the screen? Yeah, I can share the screen. Thank <laughs> you.